What's going on, everybody? This is Mike D, Mr. Double Down on You, with another episode of Black Fathers Now. And I'm going to tell you, I have a brother, a legit renaissance man, that's joining us today on this particular conversation. And this brother is none other than Halloran Hilton Hill. He's a husband. He's a father. He's a renaissance communicator who moves people with ideas. Grammy-nominated singer and songwriter, entrepreneur, speaker, longtime radio host, TV producer, and just so much more. When I say a renaissance man, I ain't lying. <laughs> like, coming to America, he ain't lying. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. Like, brother is a legit renaissance man, and I really admire him. And we'll talk a little bit about his communication style and the questions, that's questions that he asks. But then also the environments that he navigates in as a black man and how he's able to do so from a place of conviction. Because again, I admire this brother a lot. And so without further ado, fellas and ladies listening to, because y'all like to tune in to what we're talking about, let's welcome Halloran Hilton Hill. How you doing, brother? Fantastic. Thank you for the honor of being on your platform and on your show. And, and thank you for what you're doing. Like, like I was saying um, in the walk up, what you're doing is important. It matters. It's it's significant. So thank you for that, man. Thank you, brother. Like I said, we're we're all here to do our part. You know what I'm saying? Like if everybody does a little bit, then nobody has to do a lot, and then we can move this narrative forward and be all that we're called to be. So thank you for that. But also, I salute you as well. Yes, sir. And so before we get started, and everybody who listened to any of the 178 episodes of Black Fathers Now that have come on prior to, you know, the recording of this one, we always start with shout outs because the tagline to Black Fathers Now is bringing the village to the brothers. And we know that, you know, the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child is extremely important, but every successful grown person, brother, individual has a village around them. And we like to put that out front because that's who allows us to be who we are. So before we get into your story, brother, give a shout out to your village, your support system and your network, man. Um, well, uh, you know, let me just start by acknowledging uh, God. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> and, and acknowledging uh, the divine. Uh, I think without, without that acknowledgement, there, you know, the yeah. creator is, is where I start. Um, you know, specific to the context we're in, I, I have to thank my own dad. I have to give a shout out to my own father who was, who was passed on, but um, I reflect on him and I give him a shout out. I give a shout out to uh, my brothers, um, the ones that uh, remain. Um, I lost my oldest brother, but uh, my, my brothers have been real important in my life. So I want to shout them out, uh, Roland and Byron, and then my sister who is she, she is, uh, I call her a titanium angel, man. She mm. is, she is uh, angelic, but she's also tough. She's a great, great woman of God. So I, I shout her out, of course, uh, my family. And then I have a, I have a network of college classmates. Uh, I went to uh, Oakwood University, which is an HBCU. And um, there are probably... 15 to 20 of us that get together on a conference call just about every Sunday night. Wow. But we've been friends for, I don't know, um, some of us have been friends 40 years. Wow. Right? That's amazing. And, and, and to see these strong men, I mean, they're incredible. All of them doing incredible things wherever they are. Uh, shout, shout the fellas out. Um, and every man... Uh, in, in my life, I, one year I was um, I was guest speaker for a 100 black men event, and as I was preparing, I was sitting in in my in my study, and uh, I asked myself the question: Do I know 100 black men that I admire? Ooh, what? That's deep. Isn't that a great question? That, that, is, that, is a, that is a fascinating question. Do I know 100 black men that I admire? Like personally, no, not <laughs> right. I see them on TV and I know their story, but that I can text or that I can pick the phone up, you know, that's fascinating. And that's a fascinating made, question. So I made a list of people that I knew personally and people that I just admired from a distance. And I had a list of 100 people. I don't know how many I knew. Actually, I might have had a list of 40 or 50 men that I knew, mm -hmm. um, but 
I realized that I was standing on the shoulders of all of those men, all of those touch points in my life, all of those, you know, those, those interactions of affirmation had a shaping and refining effect on me. So I shout out every, every black man in my life that took a moment to affirm me mm. um, mattered and matters. And, and I, I think we may not catch that. I think one of the survival skills that black men develop is a hard exterior. Mm. And it, it really is a mechanism of survival. It's, you know, um, you get out there and if you show weakness, um, that doesn't always play well. And so we put on this hard exterior and you know, in some dynamics, it seems like weakness to even acknowledge or see one another. But I don't know which African language this comes from, but there's a word, sawabona. Mm. It's, I see you. Mm, I see you. Right? And I think the response to it is something like jabo or jabo sawabona, which is, I see you seeing me. Mm. In other words, you matter to me. And you matter to me. All, all these, you know, all, all these different men in my life that I've come across that took the moment, just a moment to see me, right? To, to, to added some dimension to my life and gave me, okay, I, I have some worth and I have some, some value. So those are the people I like to shout out. They may not even know the significance of what they did. I think of this one tell you this one quick story in the shout out okay um, this guy has passed on but his name was Sonny and um, he was the first black man that I met that was a full-time writer mm. I've never I've never seen a, a black man earn a living just as a writer that's all he did and um, so I would and he was a great musician as well and so I would hang hang out with him. Um, he was maybe 15 years older than me. And um, he, he was a very elegant person, right? He was, I mean, a really refined, smart. Um, he just was one of those brothers that was just put together, but he yeah. had a humility about himself that was, that was very winsome. And I remember sitting in his apartment and he had an older black gentleman there that he was interviewing as part of a book he was writing. And then when we got done with that, we went to a coffee shop and this is pre Starbucks. Yeah, this yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this the real coffee shops. <laughs> right. We didn't move like that. We didn't, uh -huh. we didn't move like that. And so we went to a coffee shop and he had this really sporty, uh, he had a, I love cars. He had this Volkswagen Rabbit GTI. Oh, wow me on this this twisty road and was showing me how I performed and and he just, he just spent an afternoon with me and I don't think he understood and I probably was 15 years old mm. I don't think he understood the impact that it had on me impact number one was I got to see something different than what I knew Ooh. I got Powerful. to see something. I, I saw a man that had a lot of personal dignity and self-respect, and he found a way to make a living doing something creative like that. Mm. Um, but then him taking the time just to spend an afternoon with the 15-year-old the kid, and I, were just, I just remember going, okay, I think I want to... I want to explore that possibility that I never thought existed. So that's just one example of, of a shout out that I would give to all of those men that were like that. Mm. Another, another man that was like that was a man by the name of Hunley Bats. He's alive now. He lives in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, big in the insurance business and he owns radio stations as well. Wow. And uh, I, I had my, first job in radio when I was 16. So I'm, I'm about 40 years into the business now. And Mr. Bats, um, I, I was a manager of a radio station at the age of about 20. Um, and, and so he took me under his wings 
um, in the town that I lived in. And what got me about him was on Saturday mornings, I would get up early in the morning to go sit in the park and, and think. And I would drive through downtown Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, his office building is, one of his office buildings is in downtown Huntsville, Alabama. And it is not in the quote unquote black section of town. It's just right in the heart of downtown. And it's this office building and his office is tucked in the corner of the office building and the rest of it is leased out to all of these different people. And you would never know that he owns the building, mm -hmm. right? There's a little insurance agency is in the corner of the building, but it doesn't look like it would belong to uh, a black man. Mm -hmm. And I would drive past his building. It would be four thirty, five o'clock in the morning and I would see the light on in his office in the back of his building. And so I would, I would knock on the door and he'd let me in. And I, I remember one day I said, Mr. Batts, I said, what are you doing here so uh, early in the morning? And he was like, he said, son, I got to get a running start on the day. Mm. He said, I got to be twice as good to get half as far. Mm. And he said, so he was like, you know, that's just the approach you have to have. You have to have this work ethic. And when I would come in, he would say, I'd love for you to come by. I'm going to keep working while we talk. Mm. Wow. Right. I'm going to keep working while they talk. Don't, don't miss. Don't miss what he said right there. I'm going to keep working while I talk. That, that, that says a lot. Like, literally, that's a, that's a gem. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would see this, this black man, and he would take me with him, um, around he would take me to chamber of commerce meetings he would take me to and, and he would be in in these settings where he was the only uh, black man doing business at the levels he was doing it and i saw how he handled himself and he took time with me mm. right i mean that this guy was a massive is a massive figure in my life um but he's just one of so many men so when you said shout out i'm sorry if we're eating no, up. this is awesome. Like this is but, but that those guys were were, in so many words, they were fathers to me too, because of just, you know. So I, I would never minimize, and that's why, you know, at the at the opening here, that's why I was saying to you, what you do is significant. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, the way you're networking people together to have these conversations, um, what you're doing is of a higher order. It's really important. Mm, thank you. I mean, and, and I received that and I thank you so much. And what's interesting about your shout outs, and this will lead into kind of your story as well, but you said a couple of things there. And one thing leads into a concept that I roll with a lot. And it's the concept of exposure leads to opportunity, right? It's like, you don't know what you don't know, but exposure is needed to lead people to opportunity. And you seem to have had or been blessed to have had exposures early. But th there's a couple things you mentioned. You said they, you know, you used to sit in the park and think at 20 years old, like I want to dive into what led to you having that mindset at the age of 20 to just sit in the park and think like I'm 40 now. And probably over the last decade, have I really started to come to the understanding of the value prop of just finding time to think, finding time to process. But that's something that you did at the age of 20. That's one part. Um, the other part was there was something inside of you that made you open to seeing or seeking opportunity at an early age. That's mm -hmm. something, again, that's not always there because we're not training our minds per se to seek opportunities, but you tended to do, you seem to, to have done that at an early age. But then I'll also add something because these two individuals that you mentioned specifically, and obviously there's a whole host of others, they saw something in you. And I think that's important for black men to start grabbing individuals that you see talent, you see potential and cultivating that potential. And I'll give an example in my, in my own life. When I was doing pharmaceutical sales, I had a mentor 
who was my regional business director. So he was over the whole region of, you know, the United States with one of the Fortune 500, Big Five Pharma companies or whatnot. And when I had started, I was 24, just got into the business. And within the first two years, I was working conferences all over the country and flying to this event to represent this major organization at a, you know, some trade show. Me, this young brother out of, in Knoxville, I'm not from Knoxville, but living in Knoxville, Tennessee, I was given these opportunities and there really wasn't anything overly special about me. But a regional business director who ultimately became one of my mentors, you know, I asked him years later, I was like, so why is it that I was given these opportunities and nobody else was? And he said, Mike, I'm going to be honest with you. I just gave you an opportunity to do things and see things that others have been able to see for years before you. So I was basically opening up the window for you to get some of the opportunities that the white boys were given. I was given that opportunity to you. He pulled me in to help me to see things, to expose me to stuff on a different level because he saw something in me. And so when I hear your examples, I resonate with, it, with that because I thought back to my own experience of these individuals were pouring into me because they saw something. Yeah, um, yeah this is, this is uh, what, what you're saying brings up a, a lot of, of great emotion. Um, it goes back to my father. Mm. Right. So, you know, black fathers now. That's right. Now. I love the word now because mm -hmm. it means you got to be present. Yes. Um, I, 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 one of the um, uh, acrostics that I use for the word now is uh, to notice, to notice the moments that you're in. Mm. When you notice the moments you're in, to own those moments, to, to be part of creating something out of those moments that has value, um, which allows you to win those moments. Mm, I, woo, to notice, to, to, own, notice, to own, and to win. To win and to win the moment, right? I have, a, I have, I have I want to throw something on top of that. What, what word is there if you spell now backwards? You won, you won. So if you focus on now, you can eventually spell it backwards. <laughs> you won, <want. laughs> right? Deep. So, so, yeah. so let me so so let me just start with my father, and I think that that would be the the genesis. And so, right now I'm I'm working on a on a new book, and it's called uh, Joy One Hundred and One: A Toolkit for the Well Lived Life. Mm. Um, I love. I love learning. I just, uh, I've been studying positive psychology for the last six years independently. And as part of one of the online courses that, that, that I was taking, I had to do a 250 question character strength survey. Mm. And I was really surprised at the outcome of the survey because it identifies your top five character strengths because the whole idea is, if you really want to live well, then you organize your life around your strengths, mm. right? Absolutely. Doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean that you don't try to improve your areas of weakness, mm -mm. but you leverage your strengths. Yes, and right. You enjoy life more. And so it gave me my five top, but my number one strength is love of learning. Mm, that's deep. It, it is the, it's the pinnacle. I'm happy when I'm growing, <laughs> right? That's mm. when, I'm, when I'm learning something new, when I'm growing. I always knew that, but I didn't know it enough to be more intentional about organizing my life around that. Wow. It's funny, you know, I always wanted to start this wisdom university and it's been burning in my chest for 30 years and i didn't know why did i why did why do you want to create a learning platform and a you know a learning mm. you know technology that's who i am right mm. where did that come from that's what you asked for where does this desire for growth come from it came from my father and this is the origin story my father one of seven children born in Chattanooga, Tennessee in the year 
1923. Um, he was the oldest of seven, born to his mother at 16. Um, and he was sort of like the father that his father wished he could have been. His mm -hmm. father served in World War I, came home. He was a guy about 5'8". He may have weighed 130, 140 pounds. He looked like a little frail person. And part of it was his growth had been stunted as an orphan. Mm. My grandfather was found on the streets of Chattanooga, orphaned. Mm. Um, and he was taken in by uh, this wealthy white woman and was raised in this orphanage called the Steel Home for Children. But he had been malnourished, and I think that stunted his growth. But he had a family, uh, comes back from the war. He goes to work for the King Pharmacy in Chattanooga. And he has this affinity for mixing drugs. So he literally worked upstairs in the pharmacy. And the pharmacist, they called him Doc. They say, hey, Doc, Miss Jones needs something for her cough. He would mix it. Mm. He would put the King Pharmacy label on it mm. and he would carry the mixture that he had made under another man's name on a bicycle to some person. And he was treated like he was a little boy. Mm. So he was suffering these indignities. And so he self-medicated with alcohol. So mm -hmm. he had a problem with alcohol. And my father was a football player and his Friday nights were, were spent, um, he would play football, his father wouldn't be there and he'd get home, he'd change clothes and his mother would send him out to go find his father at one of the various uh, juke joints and he would put his father on his shoulder and carry him home and dry him out. Mm. Brothers and sisters woke up. Wow. I was looking at a video of my uncle who, by the way, ended up becoming a pharmacist. Uh, wow. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a chemist for DuPont. Wow. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? the, the genetic, the genetic <laughs> lineage, right? <laughs> right. All of the, all of this will factor into into our conversation too. Uh huh. And, uh, he said of my father. He said, my father was the elegant father we always wanted. Mm. So he fathered his brothers. He said, he taught us how to tie a tie. He carried himself with this dignity. He was the first one to go to college and he gave us something to want to become. Ooh. Outside Aspirational. Of what, outside of what we want. So here my father took on this really um, important optimism. And my father just decided that he was going to live a life beyond where he was. Mm. He was going to go to school and he was going to figure out a way not to have to work by the sweat of his brow. He was going to develop and use his intellect mm. as a platform for his future. And so he goes to college, he becomes a minister, he does whatever, but my father loved to read. And I love telling the story about my father because you said, where does this come from? And I think it's a great gateway, gateway into a conversation about fatherhood. My father, a lot of, some kids that have a great father, there are a lot of people who don't have a great connection with their father. But some, you hear stories of my dad used to play ball with me. My dad was at every game. My dad was, which is great. My bonding experience with my father was around books. Mm. So, so his habit was um, to go to the library every Sunday afternoon and he would get two books. He would take me with him. I remember him doing two things. On Saturday night, one of the security guards and janitors at the newspaper, we were living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel or something like that. He would pull up to the front of the building and one of his friends would bring him out the Sunday paper mm. Saturday night. Wow. Right. So he, um, had, he had juice too. He had juice, right? <laughs> so, 
So I remember this big, thick newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. And he was sitting on the seat of the car and then Sunday afternoon, he would um, go to the library and he would take me with him. And so I would pick out a kid's book and my dad had this upholstered chair in the corner of his room. And, and let me just make this note as a nugget. He had a space in his home for learning. Mm. Grow. Make space for it. Make Not space. only mentally, but physically. Make space. Wow. And so he would sit in this upholstered chair and he didn't watch television. He would watch the evening news and that would be it. Uh, he might watch a little John, Johnny Carson, but he mm. would sit in the chair and he would read at night. So I'd sit on the floor next to my dad and I couldn't read as fast as he could read, but I could turn pages as fast as he turned pages. So uh -huh. I turned pages until my mind caught up. Wow. Woo, woo, woo. Pause, 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 pause. I just turned pages until my mind caught up. Yeah. That, that's, you can't gloss over that. That is something, and, it's, and that is not a fake it till you make it scenario. It's not no, no, no. putting on a persona. You turn no. pages fast until your mind caught up but it started with the intention of i want my mind to catch up to how fast i'm turning yes. it because i'm yes. watching my dad yes. turn yes. these pages yes dude and part of my personal development protocol with double down on you there's a category called openness and intention you have to be open but then you also have to be intentional in regards to how you operate fellas listen to the gym he just dropped I turned yeah, the pages yeah. fast until my mind caught up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Deep. So I'm sitting there, but this, but this is the real, and this is something for all fathers to get, right? There is what we receive by DNA, right? Mm -hmm. What we get internally, the instruction set, You're, the piece of you that you are comes from this mixture of chromosomes, it's mom and it's dad mm -hmm. connecting to create a new you. And in that is an instruction set. It tells you who you are. Um, so there's something that you are on the inside by virtue of who they were. Mm. So who you're becoming is what you're bequeathing. Mm. Right? When you develop yourself, that self-development, especially prior to having children, you're passing along that energy. Mm, yes. Ooh, he's speaking I, my language. You, yes. Internally. Internally. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first part. But the other part is what you, what's on the inside is also compounded by what's on the outside. Mm. <laughs> This is what my father did for me without me knowing. There was an energy around the reading of books, right? Mm -hmm. He had joy mm. as he was reading books. It was a joyful enterprise for him. Mm. He wasn't reading or learning. Um, it wasn't excruciating. It wasn't something he had to do. Yeah. It was something he needed, he wanted. And there was this joy around it. Hmm. I wanted to be in that energy. Hmm. I wanted to be in the wake of that joy. My mother battled with depression and she radiated an, an, an energy. And I remember how difficult it was to, to reconcile the energy, even though my mother's words were right, her energy was off because of what she was battling within her depression. It was not a fault of hers. It just was the reality of the dysfunction. Mm. And I remember battling that energy, but my father had this energy around him that he was generating by his love of learning. And so I made a subconscious connection mm. between learning and joy. Mm. Ooh, the joy learning connection. That sounds like another right. book as well. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so imagine once you make that connection, right? And then this alpha male in your life, this iconic figure in your life is stamping you with that imprint. Internally, right? Education is what got him out of the level. That, so, so he was literally trying to think his way to freedom. Mm. 
Ooh. I would frame, would frame it. Mm. He literally was leveraging himself out of where he was through knowledge and through the joy of learning. Um, and I remember he gave me my first library card and I wish I could find it. And that would be so. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. But I remember how he laid it in my hands. He told me to hold out my, we went to the library, we signed up, the lady put together, I remember the card was like orange and, um, and it, they used to have the, when you open the book, it had a little jacket in it that had a card in it. Yeah. Return date. No, you can Google all this stuff, guys. You, know, <laughs> yeah, you gotta be of a certain remember, age to know about that. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, but I remember we were at the library in Milwaukee and we're standing there in front of the desk where the lady has just made the card. And my father tells me to hold out my hands. And I held out both hands like this. And he took the library card and he placed it in my hand. Mm. Right? And he said, you know what this is, right? I said, you know, the library card? He said, no, 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 no. He said, this is free tuition. Mm. He said, every time you want to learn something, every time you want to know something, this card will open you up to worlds where every library is your free tuition-free university. Mm. Son, you're free to learn whatever you want to learn because you know how to read and you have access to the knowledge, right? And I remember I got a little card, you know, and I, I would go to the library. I, mm -hmm. The funny thing is, whenever the, the, this is, this is, it carried me throughout my life. When my father and I would, when we would travel to other cities to visit relatives, my father didn't sit around in the family gossip. Mm. We'd be sitting there, we'd be in, I don't know, we'd be in Milwaukee or Chicago, or we'd be wherever. And when everybody's, we're going to have a dinner that night and everybody's sitting there just kind of talking and whatnot. And my dad would say, come on, Deke. And we would find the biggest library in town. Wow. Chicago has this fantastic library downtown. Um, Boston has a fantastic library downtown. We would be wherever we were, we would go into the biggest library there was. Mm. And it was like we were going into these cathedrals of knowledge. And my dad would just be like, he would just be lost. And we'd be among the stacks. Once again, it wasn't the books per se, it was living in the wake of that yes. story and making that connection. Bro, dude, I'm gonna tell you, that story itself is fascinating on so many levels. The joy learning connection is one, but the notion of your dad, you know, when you think about what, how, and why, right? What is the books, but how he presented books to you, this is the gateway to learning. This is your free education. He presented it in a way, you know, there's a, uh, and then the why behind it was your dad understood that these were the gateway. And so by you developing this joy of learning, you then have no limitations. Hence, anything will be possible. And, and I'll tell you what's, uh, what's interesting, man. Um, the whole concept of how your father presented it. You know, I have a really good friend of mine who, when we were in high school, his mother passed away right before he went to college. And I remember at his mother's funeral, his brother was a minister, so his brother was doing the eulogy. And his brother was talking about how his mother was extremely um, focused on how things were presented. And he left a quote there, and this was over 20 years ago now. And he said, his mother used to always say, information without presentation is just data. Ooh. That's it. Information without presentation is just data. And it's funny, that is something that over two decades from now, I've still internalized. But then when I look into today's landscape, you know, everybody's not a data scientist. Everybody's not in data analytics. Everybody can't transcribe an algorithm and all of that. So if you can't understand and if things are not presented in a way that you can groove with, it ends up becoming just data. And for most people, like you mentioned, DNA, data just becomes numbers, bars, dots, dashes, and all of this stuff. And nobody, you can't do anything with it. So again, your father was attuned to the fact that I have to present this thing in a way that he can get it at this point. 
and it's going to groove with them. That's one. But you also mentioned this concept of DNA and how part of, you know, our genetic lineage leads to who we are. But you also opened up, and this is, again, another thing in which your father was attuned to, you know, even in his, his era, in his day and age, was the concept of epigenetics, right? How your environmental factors mm-hmm. contribute to your gene expression. And so we can come from the gutter, you know what I'm saying? We can come mm-hmm. from bad places, but there are environmental factors that have, and, once, and you mentioned subconsciously, you got to a place in which you started to internalize it. If we do that in our own lives, we, yes, we can come from a not great place, but we can then use these environmental factors to then restructure how our genes express. And then you can see how folks turn the corner and they basically come from nothing. So it's just like, I see all of these themes and stories in this one example of time with your father going to the library, but then him also guarding you from various scenarios. So he knew the danger of gossip. He knew the danger of getting into the mix of all of that. So he saw that stuff come and he was like, come on, doc, let's, let's ride out of here. <laughs> it's like, he saw it. Like it's to me, there was so much wisdom in just that exchange there that we need to be mindful of because as elders to the generation coming behind us we see stuff coming we need to do that in the sense of i see something come around the corner i'm like hey young man come on come holler at me for a little bit let's let's take a ride i'm guarding him from something that he doesn't even realize is a threat right right so i i think that was the opening that changed the way i saw learning and knowledge and wisdom and when you become open to something, mm-hmm. you start to see it. Yes. So I might not have seen Sonny, and I might not have seen Mr. Bats if I hadn't seen my father. Ooh, 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 ooh. Fellas, listening, if you're raising kids, if you're a mentor, a big brother, an uncle, a coach, somebody who is in the life inspiring someone that's coming behind you, be mindful of the fact that your experiences and what you open that you know, individual who's following you up to is the gateway to them then seeing opportunities later in life. So don't miss out on opportunities to open people up, to expose the next generation. I mean, that, ooh, that's deep. And that came from your father, which even, oh my gosh, that's, yeah. that's deep, I, brother. I, and I'm not totally sure that he was conscious of what he was doing. Mm. I do know that he was somewhat aware, but I mean, right up until the, um, the last, uh, I would go see my father often. And every time that I would go see him, I used to keep a duffel bag in the back of my truck and I would always have two or three books. Mm. He knew that I was mm-hmm. all, I've always been, uh, I've read some incredible books this year, but I, I'm always reading cause I don't, I don't know that I love reading as much as I love learning. Mm. Like I said, there's an energy around it. That's right. And I asked my dad, I said, do you love to read that much? He said, no. He said, I love learning that much. And he said, reading is my crowbar. Mm. Uh, he said, not. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> that, that's... So, so, so right up until, you know, some of my last memories of my dad was I would come, his vision was starting to go, and he would say, what you reading? I'd say, I'm reading this book. He'd say, well, read it to me. Mm. I'd go get my duffel bag, and I'd sit in his room uh, and just read. I was his audible.com. Mm, <laughs> back before Audible. <laughs> <laughs> you were Audible before Audible. <laughs> right, right. And and he would, I would think that he was dozing off, and I'd try to stop reading. He'd go, no, 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 keep going, keep going. I mean, mm. so he was he was he was loving learning even at at, at, the, at that age, and and I think that's what opened me up. That's that was, I mean, I've taken an incredibly long route to getting to answer your simple question was what do you what was it that opened you so you could see that, mm. and uh, um, I think that's what it was. Man, that's I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the concept of learning 
and reading. And again, we didn't, you didn't hit me to this being the, the trajectory or, or the, 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 the storyline that you were going to talk about prior to our conversation. And it's ironic, okay? And maybe not so ironic. I think the Lord works in mysterious ways and sometimes the ways ain't so mysterious. I want you to look at something. What does this shirt show you? <laughs> guy sitting on his basketball reading. <laughs> is is that not I mean, dude, a lot of times and this is you know one of the shirts from my apparel line. Um, a lot of times I wear like a Black Fathers Matter shirt or whatever when I'm doing the interview, and I just happen to put on the Yes Boys Read t shirt today. <laughs> and who the thunk that <laughs> Again, I say the Lord works in mysterious ways, and sometimes he ain't so mysterious. He's right in your face. He's like, look, dude, open your eyes. It's right there. And I was just sitting there thinking. I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> get that shirt, by the way, y'all. Get that shirt. Yeah, get that shirt. Yes, boys, read. <laughs> Blackfamilyapparel.com. But, um, but, yeah, man, it's just like, and, you know, what's interesting, as you start to share that one story about your dad, and I think to your radio show now or when you do interviews you know when a caller calls in or when you're you know talking or having a dialogue with someone you tend to start with this one phrase or this one question and you say what do you think and why do you think it right and what's funny about that is you know what do you think now that's easy i mean that's basically somebody giving their opinion the deep question that people aren't always capable of really articulating is the why do you think it? Because to me, it goes into two different directions. A lot of times it's either, well, I read something and that aligns with my political ideology and whatever. And that's really not a why. You're just basically finding something easy that, is, that grooves with who you are. But the real why do you think it is this deep dive reverse engineering back to situations like, you know, why do I think it? Well, I love learning. Well, why do you love learning? Because my father opened up this window to me and he showed me the intersectionality of joy and learning. And he also showed me how learning is the gateway for me to get to a place in which anything is legitimately possible. Yeah, that's I mean, that's I mean, you're, you're spot on. Um, another example of my father, uh, and then, and, and I'll kind of knit, knit this into how it factors into my life as a father. I have, I have two children and I would not credit myself as being a, a great father for most of their lives. Um, I think some of my failings as a father really helped me gain so much more insight, but, uh, my mother was an extremely stern woman, mm. um, and the, the how rigid and stern black parents were uh, when I was growing up really was a prophylactic. Mm. They were trying to guard us from being swept into systems yep. where we wouldn't have control. Yep. And so, and so they were very authoritarian and it was fear. Mm -hmm. It was my son is out there in the street and he's rebellious and he's this or that. I'm going to beat it out of him. Yep. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Once he gets swept up into their system, mm -hmm. there is no mercy. There may be very little justice. So mm -hmm. scare the hell out of him. Absolutely. Right? My mother was an incredibly stern woman. Um, she was no jokes. I like to, uh, I like to say she was a stick of dynamite, dynamite wrapped in velvet and lace with a one inch fuse <laughs> that, wow. had been, that had been dipped in gasoline. Oh, it Lord. It didn't take nothing but a spark. Uh -huh. right? Look, they lived in a house full of matches. <laughs> so I have this blood borne curiosity. I'd love to tinker. I like to think. I like to pull things apart to see how they work. I, you know, that's my dad's fault. It's her fault too, because she was insanely creative. So I remember we had this guest bedroom and it had these two single beds and it had these beautiful white bed spreads and you weren't supposed to go in there. It's just like that living room that has plastic on the furniture and you don't go in there. Mm -hmm. But I love to play on these bed spreads because the bed spreads had these channels in it that looked like highways. Mm. And so I'd take my little Hot Wheels car <laughs> And I would literally drive around the world uh -huh. on these bedspreads. And so I remember I was in there playing on these white bedspreads. And I remember 
I had some radios or something that I was taking apart. And I had some stuff plugged in and I'm taking it apart and I got cars all over the bed and something sparked mm. and burned a hole into the bedspread. Whoa. And so I burned this hole. I'm like, oh, here comes this lady. And my mother smells something burning. She comes in there and she just absolutely loses. Mm. When your father gets home, mm. so my father comes home and she is livid. And she says, you need to go in there and talk to that boy. Mm. So he goes, okay. So he walks in the room and he shuts the door behind him. Um, and he looks at me. He looks left, right. <laughs> he winks at me. Uh -huh. And he goes, what's going on in here? Right? I'm standing there like. <laughs> and, and then he comes over closer to me and he said, what do you think happened? Mm. What, what, what do you mean? He said, oh, calm down. What do you think was the chemical or electrical reaction that happened to burn the hole in the mattress? Well, I think such and such. He said, why do you think it overheated? What do you think is going on there? We were having... Um, wow. <laughs> We were having a science lab. Yes. Right? Uh-huh. I'm so we clean up and I'm sitting there going, well, why did that happen? What, what did I do? What, did I cross some wires? Did I do whatever? This is the truth. That year on my birthday, he bought me my first electronic set. Oh, dude. Mm. <laughs> Man, can I tell <laughs> you? <laughs> Again, your father, like, there, there was so much wisdom there. So if you look at, like, the, the tech industry and you hear about, like, innovation and MVPs and starting, you know, startups and all of that, you hear the concept or this concept used to float around and it said move fast and break things, right? That was the whole concept, move fast and break things, meaning if you're breaking things and you're moving fast, you're getting somewhere, you're trying, right? A lot of, uh, but that usually does not flow in the black community or the African-American demographic, we try not to break things. We want to make, don't let that fall off the shelf. Don't tear that thing up. It's this scarcity mindset at times, but a lot of it is rooted in history, right? Your father had the wisdom back in the day to tell you to move fast and break things. But there was another thing when, because he was such you know, a, a big proponent of learning, when he saw you having an interest in something, he poured gasoline on that fire and allowed it to burn. Fellas, pay attention to that. Again, I'm not saying to tell your kids to go and just start breaking stuff because then your wife gonna put you on the couch perpetually. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating that because the couch is, you know, I'm hitting 40, so the couch is not good too often throughout the, you know, we'll talk later about that. But when you notice things and you see that there's some level of interest in something, as opposed to punishing, sometimes take a step back and see if there's an opportunity because how many world-renowned chemists started from burning stuff up? How many world-renowned chefs started from burning dinners and whatever? How many engineers started from breaking every radio in the house You know that you now hear about? How many of these startup guys who have multi-billion dollar organizations had failures before or their parents allowed them to screw up and fail a little bit like failure is not always fatal it's sometimes it's just a learning opportunity but if you see that there's this twinkling of a itch or whatnot that your kids have pour a little bit of gasoline on it and see where it goes that you, coming from that air i'm trying to tell you dude like it's so fascinating an african-american man who was born in 1923 had the wherewithal when you were a kid, and I'm not going to tell your age, but I guess it was a little older than I am, but <laughs> had the wherewithal a few decades ago to think that way because that was so countercultural to stay in your lane, do what you're supposed to do, follow the rules, don't break nothing, you better be scared, keep your head down, forget all of that. He's like, no, how does this thing work? Let's tinker with it. Like, yeah, yeah, he was he was insistent upon personally, and then he pushed it 
probably more to me than maybe even my siblings. Um, he was insistent on you being an original thinker. Ooh, love he it. was love insistent it. on it. He was like, be original, be original. And it's funny in, in, in this list of character strengths that came up for me, uh, creativity, ingenuity, and originality showed up as I think like number four. Mm. Uh, once again, but this is the impact of a, of a father. Mm. He, there's a distinction between curiosity and rebellion. Ooh, expound upon that. He could tell the difference between my native curiosity and whether or not I was just in the bedroom, just messing up the bedroom because I'm being rebellious to my parents. Mm. The difference between curiosity and rebellion. And so I think he didn't want to stamp out that fire. But, but I think he also was trying to be a ballast against yep. something else that I was experiencing. Number yes. one, he knew what was going on with my mother and he knew how that was infecting and affecting our family system. Mm. And I think he was trying to counterbalance that um, because he knew about his own family system. Mm. He knew what it was like to, to, to kind of live through dysfunction. And so his optimism in the face of that dysfunction, that he saw that. But then he also saw the penalty that I was paying for being a curious, precocious young kid. Mm. It, played, it didn't play well in the streets. Mm. Mm. It did not play well in the streets. Punk, sissy, mm. faggot. Mm -hmm. those, were, those were the things that I was called on a repetitive and regular basis in my neighborhood. Because you didn't, you I weren't in bullied. line. That's right. Because you weren't in line with what everybody else was doing. You, you could talk to, you could talk to my best friend, John Wright, and he will tell you that when we were 16 years old, we go to this party and I literally go to the party with all my friends and everybody's dancing and I literally am sitting in the corner and I'm reading a book at a party. Wow. Right? Wow. I literally am reading a book while Flashlight is playing. <laughs> oh, P-Funk is dropping <laughs> Flashlight. And you're like, give me a flashlight so I can read this page, man. I'm in the... Literally. No, this is a true story. And literally, this, wow. this girl comes over to me and she said, are you literally reading a book at a party? Mm. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm reading a book. So I'm, I get I get bullied, I get made fun of, and my father is conscious of the forces that are fighting against this beautiful thing, mm. right? Wisdom and learning and just the joy of growth itself had been such a, a savior to him. He didn't want to see that get stamped out in me. Mm. I think he was adding a measure of affirmation so that I wouldn't resign from that mm. just for the counterfeit of affirmation. Ooh, dude, that, that, again, wisdom, insight, but then you also throw another component of discernment. So being able to discern whether or not this is curiosity or rebellion, you know, right. but then also understanding you and spending time and knowing who you are, like your father, you know, it's like a lot of us don't spend enough time, even though we might physically be in the same space, we don't spend enough time with each other to truly know each other. That's dangerous. But the other part to it is we don't do the same thing with ourselves. You know, being by yourself and spending time with yourself are two different things, right? It's like being by your wife and spending time with your wife are two different things. You know, you can be buyer and don't know what's going on. You're spending time with you. You're paying attention. You're understanding. And the same thing happens with your kids. When you pay attention, when you're spending time with them and you understand the nuances of who they are, then you are properly equipped to help counterbalance those forces that they are going to face or that they are currently facing. But if we don't spend that time 
We oh, don't wow. know. And we're just throwing, you know, it's like a shot in the dark. We're throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. And that might work, that might not, but it's a gamble versus spending time to know what is really making this person tick. Right. Let's get to that. There's a, there was something really interesting that happened. Um, there was something really interesting that, that happened um, later on in my life was, and I think he knew I would get to this point of, personal and intellectual liberty. Mm. There was a point at which I didn't need the, the verification of a group of peers in order to pursue what I was called to. Mm. Mm. I, because I didn't grow up getting that. Later on, you don't grow up needing that. From peers. You got it from your father. Right. But you didn't need it from those external like friends, and I don't care if you like this or like that. I wasn't seeking that external validation. Oh. So, so, but I ended up with a group of peers. I ended up with a group of peers because of that, who actually like the fact that I think for myself. Mm. Wow. Right. That's that. <clears throat> that's that's fascinating because you tend to gravitate, uh, eventually you gravitate to your tribe, so to speak, eventually. I mean, it might happen when you're a kid. It might not be until you're in your 40s or 50s that you finally find your tribe. But when you get there, it's like you've been cultivated for this, but you also had the patience to hold off or hold out until my tribe formed. And so to me, that's it's kind of like delayed gratification because right. – if you're a person who needs external validation, then you're like, you know, forget it. Even though I know I don't groove with this group and it's not great for me, I need somebody to validate who I am. So I'm just going to fall in line with them. But that's to your detriment, literally, typically, unless you have the wherewithal to have patience enough to wait until that tribe forms, then you can freely be yourself. Right. You, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to be. And I, and I think how all of this leaches over into you know, my experience as, as a father, uh, I have two children. Um, well, my son, Halloran uh, II, um, he is, uh, he'll be 32. Um, well, I guess he'll, yeah, he'll be 32 um, this year. And um, he's, he's, such a, he's such a great person. I, I really like him. Uh, and then my daughter will be 26. And the fir I was running from poverty most of my life mm. because I did because functionally I did not have an understanding of wealth. Right, I thought it was financial, mm. pure, and and wealth is a, is a state of mind. Absolutely, it is assets over liabilities. Mm -hmm. So. And running from the poverty that I saw, because we were poor, like we were rich, you know, in, in that, but the knowledge and wisdom thing hadn't paid off in net worth. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I, when I started out as a father, man, I, you know, married at 22 and, and I, I just, I built my understanding of being a father on staying in the relationship number one and then number two being a provider mm -hmm. that was the assessment that i made early on i'm gonna go get it for my family i'm a, I'm a grind so i've always been a three to five job person <laughs> most mm -hmm. of my life i'm i'm getting it right mm -hmm. um that being a provider um, actually put me in a position where I got what I thought were excused absences. Mm. What you thought were, gotcha. Thought were excused absences, right? So if you're working, first of all, if you're working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, you are inefficient. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The, the, the goal standard is to figure out a way to balance your life. 
since you, you have so much impact within a tighter window, you get more output out of a tighter window that you have more time for the balance of your life. But mm -hmm. I'm working 18 hour a day. I mean, I, I would grind because I had all of these, I, I made an assessment of myself where I was and I'd read the parable of the talents. Mm -hmm. and basically the story of the parable of the talents in the Bible is God put something in your hand, double it. That's right. Multiply. That's just, right. Just double what you got. Just double mm -hmm. what you got. And so I made an assessment of what I thought were the five strong areas of my life. And I said, could I turn each one of these into a stream of income? Mm. And so I saw them, I went about, I ranked them one through five with the one that would have the greatest impact on top. And I said, I'm going to allocate my time and resources to each of these five areas based on what its ROI would be. Mm. But I was engaging all of them and I started, you know, having these streams of income based on those things. But it took me away from my family. Mm. So, so the first decade of being a father, if I were rating myself, I would say I sucked because I, I just wasn't, I was there, but I wasn't present. That's right. That's right. And that's one note that I, I want to make is your presence, like you were mentioning this earlier, being present, being in the now mm -hmm. will do more for your kids than you could ever imagine. And they don't know how to convey to you the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And so you won't feel the validation now mm -hmm. because they don't know how. They don't have the language. They don't have, they'll be 50 year old, 40 year old men and it'll just, they'll, it'll open up to them, but they can't language it now because children are inherently selfish. Mm-hmm. They're we born have, that way. You know, and mm -hmm. teenagers are good God. <laughs> Mine are and nine we, and seven. I hadn't gotten there yet. <laughs> and our culture is so self obsessed. Mm -hmm. So uh, first decade, but I, I started to get a little bit better uh, later on. And, uh, and I've watched it come full circle. My kids are trying to get after it in their lives. My daughter, I would sit and read, uh, I would read to her every night. I remember I moved my daughter. She graduated from, uh, got her master's from Savannah College of Art and Design in creative writing. Mm. And uh, I had to move her from Savannah to Asheville. And so we went to move her apartment and I get a U-Haul. And I was so tired after moving her. And it wasn't because of the couch. It was because of the books. Mm. Wow. Box upon box upon box of books. She had a bookshelf in her bedroom and it was just full of books. When she was a little girl, the bookshelf was full of books. And it was a direct outgrowth of laying there reading books with her. Mm. Now she was a creative writer. We would lay in the bed and her name is Hallie Nicole Hill. And I would, I would mispronounce her name on pur pur purpose. I would say Hallie and a goat named Bill. <laughs> no, that's not my name. And I'd say, no. Hallie is this magical little girl and she has this invisible goat named Bill and they saved the world, right? Wow. And, and I would say, where's the goat? And she'd go, Bill is right over there. And I would start these stories mm. and then she would finish the story. I'd go, well, what happens next? And she'd go, you know, Bill is doing whatever. And so she came to visit. She's now at the uni working at the University of Wyoming, but she came and we spent a uh, a Saturday morning having breakfast together and we sat there and she was unpacking for me her creative process, how she mm. writes. She just finished her first big short story was published by the literary journal, the Oxford American. Mm. And she was walking me through her process, uh, her creative process. And she was talking about how she imagines things and all that kind of stuff. And she said to me in one of our conversations, she said, thank you for letting me be me. Mm. She said, I never felt the pressure to be anybody else mm. or you. Mm. Right? Ooh. Right? Ooh. Now, that, that in and of that all by itself, right? Mm. Uh, 
I remember looking at my daughter, she's made all these different choices and she would ask me what I think. Um, uh, and, and she was about to go to a school and we went and visited the school and I went with her on the tour. And the, she asked me what I thought about this, this particular college. And uh, I gave her this clinical analysis. I said, well, let's go over facilities and let's go over curricula and let's go over finances. And mm -hmm. I had this, you know, this spreadsheet. Break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had a spreadsheet. Look, we can go line by line. Yeah. And, and, and then my wife was like, uh, what did you say to her? I said, well, I told her this, 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 this. And she was torn up, right? And um, my, I asked my daughter, and she said, I just wanted to know if you thought I make good decisions. Woo! Mm. Right. You, you she <laughs> wanted validation from her father, just like you got validation from your father. And we talk about the genetic lineage of how this thing starts, how we get the ball rolling, the snowball effect. And I'll tell you what's so powerful the lineage of your father will live on for generations to come because guess what she's going to do? Guess what your son is going to do? And it's like, we, you know, I interviewed a brother not long ago. And one of the things he talked about in his life was he said, you know, I want to create artifacts, right? He's like, my whole job or my goal is to create artifacts. And, you know, and I agreed with him in during the interview, but I thought back on it afterwards. And I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, my job is not to create artifacts. It's to help create an environment in which artisans can be created because the artisans are the ones who then have the capacity to cultivate the artifact or to build something else or to create something else. So it's not about the artifact. To me, it's about the artisan. And that was a methodology or a method that was started by your father. Right. That's, that's the impact and that's the power of it, right? And so my son is working for a tech company and he just started his masters. I see them pursuing their dreams, their goals, their aspirations. Mm. I see it and, and, and they feel there's an urgency inside of them to grow and to learn. But we never sat down at the kitchen table and did a five part seminar on this is So I, I, you just I, modeled it. It was modeled. Right. It was modeled that, 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 you know, uh, the, kids don't always do what they're told, but there's a very strong likelihood that they replicate what they see. Yeah. Right. So if you're reading books, eventually you'll see your kid pick up a book and lay there. I, I have a powerful example. One day um, I had my little podcast thing set up on the table and I had left the room and went outside and did something. And I came back. My little boy had the microphone in his hand. My little girl was holding the light behind my laptop like she was uh, directing it. And my little boy said, this is Mike D, Mr. Double Down on You. Like he literally <laughs> was going verbatim <laughs> with it because they, I'm, and I'm not teaching them, hey, you need to say it this way. They're watching, they're paying attention, they're learning. And it's, fellas, that's important. Pay attention to that gym. It's not always what you say, it's what you do because they're watching what you do, whether they're giving you feedback in the moment or not. I, I do want to say this to um, um, give yourself permission to grow, mm. right? Um, the work that I've been doing uh, in positive psychology really is um, positive psychology differentiates itself from general psychology. General psychology really is the study of dysfunction, yes, I mean, right, and, and trying to figure out how to get you past those. Positive psychology is the, is the psychological science of well-being. Mm, Does right. well-being have an algorithm? Does well-being have a psychological science? And what we've learned about the brain in the last decade and a half is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. That one phrase, neuroplasticity. Yes. The ability of the mind to adapt. Mm-hmm 
right, uh, to experience is amazing. Neuroplasticity implies that the brain can be rewired. Mm. One of the one of the one of the the phrases that I've coined in, in the in the book and the work is this: You are where you are because of your mindset, and you will be where you end up because of your mindset. And here's the secret. It's your mind to set. <laughs> right? I love it. And you set it through your habitual, persistent thinking. Mm. The patterns that you think in. The patterns become pathways. The pathways turn into sets or mindsets, right? They, they become the and, and I think most people, don't, A, don't believe they can grow. Mm. Neuroplasticity confirms that the brain you're born with isn't the one you're stuck with. That's right. It can grow. It can change. You have to give yourself permission to change, to become the man that, that you've been called to be, right? But here's what you have to ready yourself for. And this is a question I just wrote in my notes this morning as I was thinking. Um, two, two, um, three questions. Uh, one is, what are you full of? Mm. What are you full of? Because whatever you're full of is going to give energy to what you become. Absolutely. So if you're full of fear, self-doubt, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, if that's what you're full of, if you're full of anger, rage, whatever, that really will affect how you go and how you grow. But these were the two questions that I, I just had to sit with this morning. Two, are you ready for the reaction to the new you? Woo! Are you ready for the reaction? Man, the mm, man that, that in itself is worth hours of unpacking. Because when you think about the new you and the reaction to the new you, not always from everybody else, but just for, from, from yourself, just looking in the mirror and realizing and coming to grips with, this is me now. Are you ready for that reaction? That, that, that's such a deep, you mean to, that's so deep because you're, you build up this persona of yourself to yourself, meaning this is what I expect of myself. This is what I recognize about my capabilities. But in turn, the outside world, your, your connections, your circle, your community, your village, your network, they also build up a level of expectation about you, right? So when you now walk into this room as a totally different character, are you ready for them to be like, whoa, 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 this is not the Halloran Hilton Hill that I'm used to hearing on the radio. This is not Mr. Anything is Possible. This is not uh, what do you think and why do you think it? Whoa, this is not the brother who allows people to talk and kind of go left, but still brings it back home and doesn't get super hot on the radio. And this is not, this, it's a different brother here. I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> right. That's you, deep. The third question is, it, it's, is right connected to that, which is or was today. Are you ready for the violent reaction that the old you will have to the new you? Ooh, that, that, that fight, man. The old you is, because you think about this, it's kind of like, um, it's like when you establish yourself, right? When you establish a territory, right? And <laughs> you're fighting against this change. It's like, we're not fighting, you know, even like from a biblical perspective, we're not fighting for success. We're fighting from success. You know what I'm saying? Because right, 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 and, right, right. And that's the thing to your point. It's like the old you is here. It's established. You know, your routines are set. You've dug in, your heels are dug in, but now this new thing steps in. It's like a new sheriff on the, on the block. <laughs> so now there's going to be a conflict. There's going to be a duel with those the right. sheriffs. <laughs> right. And if if you if you could if you could imagine this new you, and if you can imagine the resistance, if you can imagine the resistance, then if you know there's going to be resistance, the resistance doesn't have to undo you as you're making that 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 
evolution. Mm. Right. Mm. But, 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 but I guess my thoughts are you also have to, you have to come with courage and confidence, right? Because if you know there's going to be resistance, right? You have to pull from something to meet that resistance. And I use courage and confidence a lot because courage is in spite of, confidence is because of, right? And so when you're facing some challenge or some resistance that you know, look, I know I'm going to hit a wall at some, it's, okay. I know I'm going to, okay. <laughs> I know I'm going to hit a wall at some point. I have to pull from something to give me what's necessary to overcome that wall. And so courage is in spite of the challenges coming, I'm going to mount up and, and make it happen. Or confidence is I can pull back on history, something that I've overcome before and use that as fuel to guide me through this, this challenge or this struggle. And, um, and I think a lot of people struggle with either not having or having a lack of courage or lack of confidence. That's why if they know there's an obstacle coming, they're going to say, you know what? I don't know if I, I don't even think I'm walking down this street because I know there's going to be some resistance. I don't have the courage and the confidence. So I'm just going to stay where I am. And we sit tight for the next decade. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. Right. Let me, um, let me, I, I want to make sure that I, I let you do some rapid fire with me and okay. <laughs> ask me whatever, whatever questions is okay. before I have to, to get away here. Um, I, I think as, as we're, as we're becoming, uh, the men that that we've been called to be. Uh, the one concept that I always like to put on there, but, because you need to allow yourself time uh, to develop, space to develop uh, for yourself. Um, the situations that you've been through in your life, based on your perspective and framing, will either define you or refine you. Mm -hmm. right? mm. they'll either define, define or refine, or refine. Mm. so when you have the mindset that all things work together for good you can reframe and you can use those fires that you've been through as refining fires as opposed to defining fires mm. right? I mm. went to prison I had a bad marriage I messed up with this that's not the definition of who I am that's what refined me so that I could become, right? Just that thought. And so I think when you think about power in your life, every man is called to, to, to have a certain amount of influence and to be a leader. And to be a leader is really to be a servant. Hmm. So I say we move from power trips where we're trying to acquire power because we feel powerless when you're connected to the divine and you have power, right? Mm. And you don't have to put, possess the power itself. What you possess is the connection to the power. Mm. Because if I try to, if I try to, if I try to possess the power itself, I can only have as much power as my container will allow. Ooh, that's deep. That's deep. But if, but if I'm connected to the power, there's no limit to how much power I have access to. So if I move from a mindset of containing to connection, mm -hmm. if that makes sense to you, then that's a different thing. So instead of me trying to acquire and hold power, I move from power trips to what I call power strips. Mm. So we move from the acquisition of power to the distribution of power, mm. right? So if you think of a power strip, all these different things are plugged into it, but it cannot provide power unless it is plugged into something, right? Mm, that's deep. So a, a great father realizing that his children are plugged into him realize realizes that part of the way that he sends distributes power through his generations is based on his connection mm. so he does the things that keep him connected mind body and spirit mm. finance he stays plugged in 
he has these what I call refined rituals of reset that mm -hmm. allow him to stay connected and charged up so that the people that are connected to him get the flow of that. And he's not obstructing, but he's actually adding to. And I didn't realize that taking care of myself was taking care of me. Yes, yes, because they're connected to you. Right. Man, I'm gonna tell you, when you're talking, I, I feel such a kindredness between your story, how you communicate and what you're talking about, because I, ref I refer to myself as a tube, not a vessel, right? Um, because the thing is with a vessel, a vessel, you know, people say my cup runneth over. The thing is what's inside the vessel doesn't get out unless it's either poured out or kicked over. Whereas if I'm a tube and not a vessel, there's two components here. First off, I don't have a bottom, meaning what comes in flows out. But then the other part to it is I have to have enough faith that the faucet's never going to get turned off. So that's a faith walk on one end, but then that's also a faith walk on the other end because I'm not concerned with holding on to it, like you say, because as a vessel, I'm limited by the size of my vessel and what's inside that vessel cannot get to the intended target unless somebody kicks it over or unless I have poured it out. And so you're, you're speaking so much here and, and I, dude, I, fellas, I hope y'all power strip, <laughs> not a power trip. Think about that. That Start to think about yourself. If you start to think about yourself there in which your kids and your circle of influence and those that you have influence over or influence on or are connected to are connected to you, you stay connected to the, the real power source, the creator, and allow that to flow through you, then it's not about holding on to the power. You want to disperse that power. That's I, I want to say one other thing, man. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting me. I, I know this maybe didn't go. I love it. No, brother, I <laughs> love it. This is, this is, man, I'm loving this, man. This is going to help a lot of people, help a lot of people. The, the other thing that I wanted to say is, um, I needed to kill my ego around fatherhood. Mm. And this, this is probably, this may be too real, but I wanted to be known as a good father. Mm. And I'm not sure that good fathers want to be known as a good father. I think they want to be good fathers. Mm. I wanted I wanted to be acknowledged as that guy as a father. I think that's why early on I was seduced by being a provider. Mm. The accoutrements of, man, his kids drive nice cars, they go to school, they live in a nice neighborhood, they, wow, he's, he really takes care of his family. He does a good job. He's the, um, your kids don't give a damn about that if you're not present. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And they know when you're virtue, virtue signal. Mm. Oh, my son's a doctor. My daughter's a this. They realize that's about your pride. Mm. Like you're using their life as a validation of your work. Mm. I'm a good guy because my kids turned out that way. And so they realize that you're not proud of them. You're proud of how they make you look. Ooh, ooh, fellas, think about that. Is it you or are you trying to live vicariously through your kids so that you can get the admonition, admiration, whatever it is that you're looking to do? I want to be known as the one who raised multiple doctors, you know, because that lets everybody know that I did a good job. It ain't about you. You're the tube. You're the power strip. It's flowing through you. That's, oh, man, the death of the ego of the dad. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. That is, that's something that a lot of us really have to come to grips with. Because if you're doing it for the likes, if you're doing it for the, sh you know, it's kind of like you're doing it for the gram, right? You know, if right. you're doing it for all of those things, you're doing it for the admiration, you know, to be completely honest, you're really not doing it for the right reason. Right. And, 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 and that's, that's a challenge because we all want to feel like we're making an impact, Right. But right. we have to make sure to realize that we're not doing it for the reaction because the challenge then comes, what happens if you don't get the reaction that you intend? Bingo. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
That's it. Right. That and you know, and you 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 talked a little bit about your story in a sense that you grew up and became a person who did not need outside validation. And that is something that we need to build into who we are so that we can walk in purpose and not feel validated or invalidated by someone else's comments or perspectives or perceptions of who you are. Because a lot of people are going to come and they don't always have the right intentions. And so to your point, having that is a superpower that some of us have to work on building so that we can be internally fulfilled and joy, joyful versus seeking that in outside forces. Right. I, I, I love the affirmation. Mm -hmm. But I rely, I rely on God for the validation. Ooh. Man. I want people. I want people to go, man. You're a good guy. You, mm -hmm. You've done. I want to be positive, and I like receiving that positive energy. And I think we all need that. Yes. But the manipulation that comes when you're addicted to affirmation is, if you withdraw that affirmation from me, does that take me off mission? Mm. Right. Does that, like, if you if you say, well, I'm going to stop giving you that affirmation. I'm still going to try to be good to my kids and take care of, them. okay, mm. track that. I'm still, I know this is who I am and this is what I'm supposed to do. That's the subtle distinction. there. Well, I got a question for you then. I mean, and this is maybe something I think that can help a lot of the brothers listening. If you know that you're a person and you've come to that realization, I look in the mirror and it's like, you know, I need this affirmation to feel good about myself or I bought this car so that everybody says, oh, you're doing the doggone thing or I'm in this neighborhood or doing what I'm doing to kind of floss, so to speak. How is it that how can we break that cycle or what would you suggest to brothers who have come to grips with, you know, that's a, a challenge that I have to overcome. How do they break that cycle? I think it really comes from spending time with yourself. I mean, to ask yourself, what are you thinking? Why, why do you, why do you think it? Like getting down to your why. Um, I, I think one of the ways that you begin to break it, for me, I, I started to ask myself, are you really enjoying it? Mm, wow, that's deep. Right? Are, are you really finding joy in this? Are you really, or is the joy from the affirmation of it? Mm. Like, is that where the, where the joy is that somebody sees you and they show you a certain level of respect or whatever? What that opened up to me, what it opened up to me was, man, in friendships and relationships, it's really important to you to be in friendships and relationships where you receive the quality of affirmation that you're seeking through these other things. Mm. So it really made me unpack the quality of my friendships. Mm. And I realized that, for instance, my, my best buddy is John Wright. We sit in folding chairs at the front of his garage uh, and listen to 70s and 80s music. And we'll sit there for a couple of hours just talking I, I would never just be intentional about spending that time with my best buddy. Um, but I get a mega dose of the kind of affirmation that I'm micro dosing through cars and this. Mm. It's really, because it's not the car. It's no. not the thing. It's the reaction to the thing that affirms me. Right. So if I recognize that, it does a couple of things for me. Number one is, I, and I'm a, I love cars. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually enjoy driving my car. That, that, that's where I, I was going to go there. Is it the react? Because we have to separate or have discernment in the sense of if you're doing it because of the reaction to the car, or if it's like, you know, I really find joy in driving this car, hitting curves and going to long drives and, if you find joy in it, then forget it. I don't care what you think. Now whether... we're the... Yes. <laughs> yes. See, I am a lover of beauty and excellence, design and craft. Mm -hmm. I really do. First of all, so doing that exercise 
also allowed me to legitimize my love of cars. I really just, I love everything about design and all of mm. that stuff. So now as I'm driving the car that I have right now that I really like, mm -hmm. I really enjoy driving it every day. I just enjoy it. The same thing is true. I, I ride motorcycles and I, good Lord, I love motorcycles. Mm. And uh, I have an older motorcycle. And uh, I, I went to the dealership and I was going to buy a brand new motorcycle because mm -hmm. the new one has all of the latest electronics, mm -hmm. all of this other stuff. And so I ride my motorcycle over to the dealership. I go on a test drive of the new motorcycle and I'm riding the motorcycle. I'm like, man, this thing is nice, it's fine, it's whatever. And I go there and I'm just going to buy the motorcycle. And for whatever reason, um, their system was down. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I just want to, let's just do the transaction now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the guy was like, okay, what do you want to do? I said, you know what? Put it, just put it on this American Express and I, I, let's just do the transaction and I'll, you know, I'll do this, I'll take care of this end of the month. So um, their system was down. Mm -hmm. So he's like, man, our system's down we'll have everything ready for you on Monday. Um, you want to keep the bike? And, and I said, no, nah, I'll just ride my bike home. I'll bring it back. I'll trade it in. We'll, we'll do it on Monday. And I'm riding my motorcycle back to the house. And man, my bike just, it felt better. Wow. Than the new one, mm -hmm. right? So I'm riding my bike and it feels, but I'm having the feeling that motorcycles have given me since I was, seven years old i'm having that the feeling of freedom and joy and this whole thing that goes on when i get on two wheels and i'm riding and i'm going alan why do you want the new motorcycle if you're having an equivalent or better spirit uh, experience and the reason i wanted the new motorcycle was simply this i had gone out riding with a bunch of people and my motorcycle was the oldest mo motorcycle in the pack mm. And I liked the way I looked. Mm. Look, I liked the way I looked mm. on the newer motorcycle. But I liked the way I felt. Mm. <laughs> That's it. I knew. Mm. Man. So, and the crazy thing was, my ego was in the way. Mm. Because I'm on my older motorcycle, and I'm having great fellowship with these guys that I'm riding with, these folks that I was riding with. And the quality of fellowship hadn't changed one iota. My perspective, my mm. perception of the quality of fellowship was being blocked by my ego that said, if they saw you on this brand new one, they'll think oh, this about they'll you. They'll think this. They were already thinking good thoughts about me. I was mm -hmm. already having the feeling that motorcycles, but I was willing to pay an extra fifteen thousand mm. dollars downgrade my experience so i could upgrade my ego the look versus the experience was tainted by the ego man mm, can i it's, th 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 literally the look versus the feeling and if you get the right. feeling and you're doing it from an internal place who cares whether it's a 30 year old bike or a brand new one if you were getting the new one because that feeling you got and you're doing it because of something that really is driven internally by you get the new one but since but. it wasn't but there's a but well you know bbd said never trust a big button to smile <laughs> this is a but you need to <laughs> you need to consider but when you really thought about it and it, again divine intervention I, I you know i'm like the lord works in mysterious ways or ways that ain't so mysterious the system was down so you could not purchase the bike that day had the system been up and running the next group you, you'd have been looking for that for that ride because you'd have had that brand new bike to go take out with everybody else and man mm. so as a father yes right <laughs> Brother, I, fellas, I, I want I, mm, that, that's that in itself. Think about your experience. Think about being internally driven in regards to your joy, your interest, your, your what you're focused on. Be internally driven. Don't get so focused on outside affirmation because the outside affirmation, if you need that to validate you, 
you're going to be seeking validation continuously. So go internal, go inside out, not outside in. Like yeah. that, in essence, is what we need to do. And I don't want to hold you too much longer because, yes, brother, sir, I, I, could, I could legitimately talk to you for hours. <laughs> and But I know we got things to do. But you, you dropped something. Um, and I want to ask one more question, you know, before we get your contact information and all of that. You mentioned something about refined rituals of reset. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you, you said that a few minutes ago. I would like to ask you, what are your refined rituals of reset so that you can stay grounded and keep yourself in, in this frame of mind as you grow and evolve continuously throughout life? Yeah. So um, the first thing, the first thing that, that we're learning in po- positive psychology is um, one of the things that you want to take responsibility and ownership of is the energy in which you live. Mm. right so when i when i tell people to i I tell people two things or i i call people to two things to one is to enjoy your life and then to enjoy your work Mm. Uh, i love words i like prefixes because prefixes fix a word right they Mm. update Uh, so when you have the word enjoy it has two pieces the prefix en means to make, cause, or create. Mm. So if I ask you to enjoy your work, that is the same root for engineer, mm. uh, uh, encourage, endure. Um, that in or en means to make or cause. Mm. So there's a shift that happens in your life when you move from happenstance, I'm going to hope that something happens to me or for me, and the happenstance is what makes you happy, right, to being an architect Mm. that makes or causes or creates joy. Joy is a sense of overall Mm well-being that even though it may not be everything on the outside may not be going well. The inside is settled. Um, It is well with my soul, Mm, right? That's right. And I'm optimistic because of where I am and who I am. So there is a, the fount of optimism. There's a flame of optimism, if you will, that is rooted in a deep sense of knowing who and what you are, right? And whose you are, Mm -hmm. right? So I, I like to say, it's like having the pilot light on, even if there's no fire on the stove. It That's is, right. It is cast iron hope, That's right? right? So when we decide to enjoy our lives, um, we've made a decision to be proactive in creating and sustaining joy. And joy really is rooted in having a, an overall positive patina to your life. So we create it. Mm. And one of the ways that we set ourselves up, mind, body, and spirit for that is by having a mindset or rituals that generate the positive emotion that you will live in or live with, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yes. Right? And so just a couple of quick things. Number one, I recommend having a morning ritual that puts you in the ready state for the day. Mm. And and the components of readiness, the question you ask yourself is, what does ready feel like and what does ready look like? Mm. If I were to walk into my day feeling ready for the day, mind, body, and spirit, what does ready look and feel like? Most people have never taken the time to just stop and go, what does ready feel like? What, what would it feel like to feel positive and to feel normal? They just kind of go from day to day, from drama to drama, from stress mm-hmm. to stress, but they never have a settled sense. They don't ever have a baseline of joy. So they don't have anything to check against either. Mm-hmm. But if drama is your set point, then you never know what, wholeness feels like but if you if you get to wholeness then you have something to to check against 
So it took me, and 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 I would I would express to everybody that's kind of uh, taking this in that you take some time, and it might take you weeks, it might take you days, just to make an assessment of what ready looks and feels like. Yes. Because your job will be if you can say if I were to imagine an excellent day in my life, right? If, if I were to imagine an excellent day in my life, top to bottom, what would that look and feel like? How am I feeling? What's the environment like? What kind of people are around me? What, mm. what does that energy feel like? If I were to imagine that, what does that, what does that look like? If you put that down on paper, if you write out that day in your life, then the next job is to reverse engineer what brings you to that state. What does my mind feel like? What does my body feel like? What does my spirit feel like? Your job is not to copy and paste my morning ritual. Your job is to engineer the one that delivers on ready for you. Mm. Right? What, what brings you to where you need to be, the way you need to show up? And that requires that thing we were talking about earlier, enough self-reflection to really get to know you. Mm. Mm. What does ready look like? So my morning ritual, mm. my morning ritual, it. my morning ritual, because I'm trying to create or generate this positive emotion in my life, my morning ritual revolves around me getting up really early in the morning. So I have space. So I have a buffer mm -hmm. before I engage my family and engage the world. I need some time. I need, yes. I need a little time to, to kind of get into my space. So I do something that is called um, five, five, five. Okay. Right? Five, five, five. So um, one of the things I do is I write in a gratitude journal every morning. Okay. Um, so gratitude journaling is a way to generate positive emotions, scientifically proven to generate positive emotions. You write down three things for which you're grateful uh, every day, right? At the top of the day, three things for which you're grateful. Um, after you write down three things for which you're grateful, you write down three things that I will do or what would make the day great. Mm. Right. The science of that, this this is all about wiring too. This is about wiring the brain. But the science of it is this. We are what Martin Seligman at Penn says, we are not Homo sapiens, sapien being wise. We're Homo prospectus. Mm. We're prospecting. We're prospecting for what we're expecting. Ooh. That's prospecting for what we're expecting. Right. If your expectation is yes. negative, mm -hmm. then you will prospect to affirm or confirm that experience. Mm. So that's so deep. What, that's deep, brother. So what, so what, what, what we found happens is when people don't feel a sense of agency, when they don't feel within themselves that anything that they could actively do would make the difference in their outcomes, they start to feel helpless, right? If there is a learned helplessness and learned helplessness always corrodes into hopelessness. Ooh, right. learn helplessness corrodes into hopelessness. Right. So when a man is hopeless, then he's not going to. So what happens is when you start to write what you will do to make the day great, you're wiring into your mind that you fully expect to have an impact on the quality of your day. Expectation. You're wiring that mm. I make things happen, right? Mm. I make things happen. Then you write down a declaratory phrase, um, I am something. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. presentations. I, I have a little note card that I keep over here on the on the whiteboard. Okay. That's one of my expressions that I wrote down in my journal. Um, this was one of my I am cards, right? I and am. what it says is, I am free, blessed, safe, saved, attracting and creating abundance in every aspect of my life. Mm. That's who I am. Because it puts you on that. It puts you on the path to look for those yes. things, right? Yes. So, you, so you write, so you write down an I am phrase. And then at the end of the night, before you go to bed, you grab your journal and it's best to write this down and you write down three amazing things that happened today. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be positive to be amazing. Mm -hmm. It just has to be amazing because most people have learned their best lessons through their worst times, right? Hmm. Once again, this is about how you frame your life because how you frame your life is how you see your life. What woo, you're doing woo, don't, don't gloss over that. How you frame your life is how you see your life. Absolutely. 100%. That, that, whew, that, that's 100%. the fellas, pay attention. Don't let that slip. How you frame your life is right. how you see your life. Think about a picture frame. That's when what you, you see. When you, when you get to the point where you go, things don't happen to me, they happen for me. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different ballgame. But when you write down three amazing things that happen to you every day, what you're doing is you're journaling against the resistance. And let me explain what I mean by that. Your mind will tell you, man, life sucks. This is not going my way, blah, blah, blah. Let the record reflect that something happens amazing to me every day. Hmm. Once again, you're wiring into your brain that something amazing is going to happen to or for me today. You're wiring the fact that I can take whatever happens to me and make it amazing, which reaffirms this sense of agency that you have. As you do that on a habitual basis, you start to rewire the brain mm. so that when you wake up in the morning, and it takes about 67 days for the momentum of this to actually start to wire in your brain. But you'll find yourself after about 60 or 70 days, you'll wake up in the morning and the energy you're gonna feel is gonna shift because you, you'll be on the hunt for things for which to be grateful. You will be anticipating making something happen. Mm. Firm it at the end of the day. So I do this thing, <sighs> gratitude journaling, and then I do what I call five, five, five. 15 minutes is literally 1% of your day. Mm -hmm. I call it the 1% solution, but 15 minutes is 1% of your day. Five minutes reading something positive and powerful. Mm. Something positive and powerful. I love the book of Proverbs. Yes, something I do too. Something positive and powerful. Five minutes sitting in silence, meditating, just, mm. just listening, maybe even just listening to your breath, but just slowing down long enough to listen, just to, to be present. Nothing profound has to happen. May, the, 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 maybe the only thing you'll experience or hear is the noisiness of your own mind. Mm, that's real. Right? That's real. But just you awakening to the noise, just you being able to separate yourself from yourself for five minutes even, awakens you to the noise and there's a shift that happens just in the level of the way you perceive yourself and perceive life. And then the last five minutes I spend uh, slowly walking through the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Mm. This self-emptying, empowering prayer uh, in, this, in this regard. The very first word, and this will especially apply to fathers, mm. um, the very first word of the Lord's Prayer is our. Our, that's right. So all the selfishness gets dumped out. Mm. Immediately it brings you into being my brother, my sister. Mm. It connects us. 
first of all, it forces you to acknowledge the infinite and that there's a greater will than your own. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there's no resistance to the will of God. That's right. No committees. Mm. <laughs> your will be done. And then you go, give us this day our daily bread. That's, I parked there for 90 seconds or 60 seconds or 45 seconds. And I asked God to meet the provisional needs of my life. Give us though. Mm. Would you give us what we need? Would you give me, give a, us, me and my kids and the people that you've given to me, this world of us that you've given me, would you give me not only what I know I need, but would you meet the needs that I don't have sense enough to ask me? Give, give us this day our daily bread. So we will need things in the temporal realm today. Money, food, give us what we need. Then this liberational part of the prayer where it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's the point where I stop and I say, God, yeah, I need you to forgive me for blah, blah, blah. Mm. These are the known things. Would you forgive me for those? But then the things I don't, that I don't know. And he goes, absolutely. But I'm going to need you to know the liberty of forgiveness. Mm. So that's where I press the clear button on all my relationships and all my whatever. So you don't, grudges are heavy. Yes, they are. Like Anger an albatross. Yes. So I get to empty out that right there. So I, I go, God, tell me to forgive, you know, the person that said that crazy thing to me yesterday, would you just let me lay that down? Then I go, lead us not into temptation. I start there and I go, I got some temptations today. That's it. Uh, I'm, fast, I'm fasting today and I'm smelling waffle fries. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? The Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. <laughs> right, help, right. Your, help your boy out. <laughs> so, so I would, I, would, I would also add that I chop this off. It says, lead us not into temptation. I pray for all the temptations that my kids are facing. Yes. That I don't know about. But yes. I know I gave some of it to them through DNA. Absolutely. Yeah, it's they there. issues that I gave them, right? Yeah, it's there. Mm -hmm. I say, lead us not into temptation. But then I chop it off and I just go, would you just lead us? Would you give me the magnetic pull? Mm. Like, would you lasso my heart and lead me to where you want me to be, right? Yes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In yes. all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct or lead. Um, instead of the uh, Black Fathers Matter, I'm going to wear the reading T-shirt today. Mm. That lit, Just that lead. Yeah. He led it. Yes. So I want I want to feel the tug of your leading in my life today. I wanna I wanna feel this present tugging, right? Let me feel your presence shaping me. Mm. I, I want to feel the energy of being shaped and led by you, and then deliver us from evil. I stop right there and I go, God, there's evil in the world. I'm looking at all this craziness that's going on in the world. Um, would you deliver me? In other words, if I'm in a burning house, I passed out because of the smoke, I've lost my capacity to dial 911. I need somebody to see the flames, kick the door in, and drag Come me. Get me. That's right. So, God, when I'm in a blind spot mm. today, would you deliver me from evil? So, I'll spend five minutes just kind of slowly walking through that prayer parking in those parking spaces for a moment, unpacking those things. And in that 15 minutes, that's what I'm, that, that's what I've done for my spirit. Yes. Gratitude journaling is what I've done for my mind. And now the next thing I got to do is I got to go get some exercise. Mm. I got, I got to get it in. Mm. I got to get it in. I got to give my body what it needs in terms of nutrition and exercise. Mm so that my physical body is awake and flexible and my mind is snapping on all the cylinders. I've given my, my brain the brain food of gratitude, if mm. you will, that's, that's generating the positive emotions I wanna start my day in, right? Mm -hmm. But then I'm giving my spirit that five, five, five 
so that it's nourished. And then the next, the, the final thing that I do is I look at my list of things to do and I compare my list of things to do to the goals that I've set for the year and the quarter. And I ask myself, am I still on track? Am I still pacing the way that I need to pace in order to accomplish what I have to accomplish? And when I look at my calendar, right, am I on point for all of the things that I need to do today, mm. right? Am I, have, am I prepared for the meeting at 10 o'clock? Am I prepared for the, the, am I prepared? Because that gives me a sense of, of swagalicious readiness. Yes. When, when I know that I'm walking in the meeting at 11 and I know Bob's going to ask me about the spreadsheet and I know I'm prepared. Mm-hmm. I feel ready. Mm. I feel ready. So that's kind of the, that's one of the things that I say is having this really well-defined and designed morning ritual that puts you in the ready state. So you yes. don't feel like you're behind the eight ball mentally, physically, spiritually, and professionally. You walk out the door with, you know. You are ready. ready. Look, fellas, pay attention to Haller and Hilton Hills refined rituals of reset. This is what he's put together to help define who he is and refine who he is continuously. And there are three components to this, gratitude journaling. And he mm-hmm. walked through the, 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 the steps of doing so, gratitude journaling. Um, the five, 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 where, you know, five minutes of reading something positive, you know, five minutes of meditation, sitting in silence, and then five minutes of slowly walking through the Lord's uh, prayer and parking at specific points that resonate, right? Think about that. Again, number one, gratitude. Number two, the five, five, five. And then the three is exercise, mind, body, spirit. And he talked about the concept of positive psychology. What's interesting about mind with your mindset, your body in essence is wired to give your mind what it wants. So we talk, people talk about the law of attraction and all of these different things. There's something to it, but from a psychological perspective, you're talking about that there, creating the mindset in which everything else is giving your mind what it wants. There's something to it. Spiritual growth and development. I'm a firm believer that spiritual conviction leads to mental commitment. Mental commitment Mm -hmm. leads to taking action. You know what I'm saying? That's good. And so if you really stop and think about that on this level, and then you start taking action with this particular mindset, with this spiritual conviction, but then you're walking in purpose with your exercise so that your temple is right. You're putting the right stuff in there to fuel your body right. Then, man, you talking about being ready? You better tell folks to get out the way. So, <laughs> so, so, man, look, I, I don't want to keep you much longer. And, you know, and, and I appreciate you, brother, because this has been an enlightening experience for me. The brothers, the ladies listening to, because they tune into what we're talking about. This has been something that I believe there's so many gems, so many carve outs, so many nuggets of wisdom that we can take and apply to our life right now, because this is Black Fathers Now. I guess as we leave, man, is there anything else you'd like to leave with the Black Fathers Now community, one, but then two, how can individuals listening connect with you, learn more about you, see some of the stuff that you have going on, give anything that you want to promote, man, throw it out there, brother. Well, I got a book coming uh, top of the year called uh, Joy 101, and there will be uh, an online course you can take uh, with that, and we'll be doing some live experiences around that. Um, There's going to be some music that's associated with it as well. So I'm excited uh, that I'm working on that. And I'll make sure that I update you. Um, I don't do a lot of social media. So um, that's a whole other conversation. (laughs) But (laughs) I'm not not on the gram Uh much. I'm on Twitter rarely. I don't, I'm not doing Facebook at all. I just, um, so I don't have a lot of contact information to Mm -hmm. give you. I know what, is there a the, website or something that people can go and kind of check your stuff out or what? Not really. My website sucks. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but Hallerandhill.com will be updated soon, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't give, I, I'm a guy who was about quality and yes. excellence and it ain't there, mm-hmm. but it will get there. It will gotcha. get there uh, soon enough. So I'm iterating as we speak. But be on the lookout for Joy 101, uh, top of the year. I, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the transformational uh, impact of that work. Mm. 
Most definitely, man. And we'll make sure to have that information in the show notes. And, you know, again, like you said, he's not really active on social media, but we're going to put some information out there just in case yes, people want to kind of scan through and yeah, yeah, take absolutely. a look at you and all of that stuff. And, you know, we, we're going to put some information out there so that people can, you know, at least see a little bit more about what you have going on. What, what are, now is your, is your, is the radio show only available in the local um, Knoxville area or is there you, like an you can application listen online? Yeah, you, you can, can listen, listen online on, on all the platforms. You can download our app, uh, News Talk 98.7 um app on apple and android uh we're available on alexa if you enable the news talk 987 skill um we're available online at newstalk987.com okay uh, so i'm on every day from 3 to 7 p.m eastern okay i have a television show on weekends on wbir channel 10 at 11 o'clock it's called anything is possible in the knoxville market we also post on YouTube and Facebook uh, the episodes every week. Um, and then Monday night at 9 on 10 News 2, which is a cable, Comcast cable channel here in Knoxville. Uh, we're looking to expand that brand in the next year, too. So we'll, we'll be going out a little bit further. But we're, we're in the lab right now. That's I feel you. Look, I'm, look, I'm <laughs> the same way, brother. In the lab, in the lab. But, but we'll make sure to put the link to the, uh, the app in the show notes for News Talk 98.7. So wherever you are around the world, if you want to, you know, get a listen to what the brother talks about on the radio, y'all can check him out, listen in, because he, he has some, some interesting conversations with some interesting, uh, some callers that are pretty doggone interesting. So it's... Uh, <laughs> it, Love you, the way you're framing that. Yeah, interesting. It, I say You're interesting crazy. for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that literally goes back to, you can see how the brother has to stay grounded with some of the conversations and callers <laughs> that he has to deal with. But again, another conversation. So we'll put some of the information in the show notes so that, you know, brothers and ladies listening to can reach out and learn more about who you are and what you have going on. Because after hearing this, I believe there are going to be a lot of folks that are like, if I haven't heard about this brother already, I, I, I need to find out more about him. So thank I you, thank bro. you so much, man. Thank you. Have a, have a great day. You too, man. Hey, fellas, 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 as always, make sure to follow Black Fathers Now on all social media outlets. Visit blackfathersnow.com. Subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, anywhere you can listen to podcasts. Subscribe, share this thing out, leave some ratings, and make sure to look up Halloran Hilton Hill. Um, he's got a new book coming out, Joy 101, coming at the top of the year in 2021, so be on the lookout for that, as well as check out his radio show. You can download the News Talk 98.7 app on your Android or Apple podcast or Apple phone and, you know, subscribe, leave some ratings, holler at him. If you can get in touch with him on social media, like you said, he's not overly active there, but, um, and if you do let him know that you heard about him on black fathers now and heard about his story, his journey, you know, his amazing insight that was garnered from his father and how that's played into his life. Just let him know about that stuff, man. And, you know, we, we salute you for spending time with us, my brother. And, yes, um, thank you so much. And fellas, Y'all be blessed, well, and wise, and we'll holler at you. Peace.